Well, first of all, uh, talking about incidents at sea, uh, I want to thank, uh, you know, I got, where, where is it? Where's Jim? There he is. Okay. I got it. You know, uh, 30 years ago, I put in a FOIA because I was interested in the incidents at sea agreement between us and the Soviet Union. So I put a FOIA into uh, OPNAV and he's the guy who got it. And he called me up and uh, I chewed my ass out. Uh, but, but anyway, he brought me on board and uh, he was very helpful for my research for my dissertation. By the way, doing that dissertation research, uh, I visited this Captain Bob Rollins up at, uh, he, he had a bed and breakfast up in uh, uh, Napa Valley. And uh, so I'm looking up on, and he has this uh, commissioning pennant and I look underneath, it says USS Thresher. And he was the, the Thresher's, uh, I guess, first XO. And uh, so I was there like, oh, okay. And, and he, he had, had just been ordered off the ship. So, uh, so he, yeah, he was also helpful in my uh, research because he was involved in the uh, team. Now, getting on to the uh, Langley, uh, the, this is the headline on the uh, San Diego Union, November 30, uh, uh, 1924. And when you think deadliest ship afloat arrives here in San Diego, it's, it's got to be the West Virginia. West Virginia was just commissioned, recently commissioned. It's got uh, uh, eight uh, 16 inch guns, you know, very powerful warship, uh, was not scrapped in the Washington Naval Arms Conference. But no, we are talking about the Langley. Okay. And uh, uh, the author decided, uh, you know, here, here's this uh, converted collier with a, you know, it's got like four or five, you know, uh, experimental aircraft on it. Deadliest ship of float arrives here. I, I don't think so, but it, but the authors kind of appreciate it because we, and when we get to the end of this presentation, I, I think this kind of, it's going to bear itself out. Okay, San Diego's aircraft here. Uh, that's the title of this presentation. Uh, I got to, you know, uh, acknowledge the Naval Historical Foundation, my employer, thank them for paying my way out here. I could have done this, uh, you know, uh, uh, from, the, from the East Coast, but it really has been a pleasure to come out here and meet and, and speak with you all and talk Naval history. And, uh, and the thing is, this is a two-part presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk today about bringing Langley to the West Coast, and it's it years as the Navy's only aircraft carrier. Initially, I was going to talk about the whole uh, uh, you know, time that uh, Langley was here, but then I started doing this PowerPoint presentation, putting the slides together. I was realized that this is going to this would last a lot longer than 45 minutes, so I'm giving myself an excuse, Sam, if you'll have me come back next year uh, to do part two. So we'll you know, we'll see how this goes. If it doesn't go well, well then I will get invited back. But uh, okay, uh, just before we get to the West Coast, here's a timeline. Uh, let me just say there's a couple of excellent articles coming out on these subjects. Uh, the general board hearings is going to be a great article on this subject in uh, Sea Power Magazine in April. Uh, the conversion of the uh, uh, Jupiter, uh, the founding, uh, this uh, guy Clayton M. Simmers is the guy who actually is the architect, uh, the Navy constructor who does all this work. There's an article coming out in next month's poll together on that. Uh, the uh, Langley's commissioning. There's a great article in the current edition of Naval History. Uh, okay, where is it? I folded the page. Here it is. Witness to Naval Aviation. All right, so well, I, I gotta like stop that. playing with that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then. Uh, uh, first flight operations is tell, told in this article. Uh, I have a diary of an uh, a, a enlisted blacksmith. Uh, very good diary. So I, I talk about that in naval history. I mentioned uh, U.S. fleet form. The uh, how, why is that important? Well, it's uh, it, it's impor important uh, because uh, you're going to have the battle fleet here on the west coast and the scouting fleet is on the East Coast and the battle fleet gets, you know, all the good, you know, the, the main most modern battleships. Uh, and there's an expectation because we're looking at Japan, uh, the scouting fleet is, is kind of got the less capable battleships, cruisers, and uh, in, in a one ocean war, they're all gonna form, out, uh, form up and I guess execute war plan orange. Uh, so uh, Langley's commission, they, they do the initial test flights 
and uh, we have some competing interests. You know, there's I'm, I'm reading going through the San Diego Union and uh, uh, and there's articles in 19, uh, 20, uh, 2, 23 talking about Langley's imminent arrival here in San Diego. They're talking about the fact that the battle fleet wants the carrier to support uh, the battle line through scouting. And also Captain Stanford Moses is the commander of Air Squadron's battle fleet. And he's not too happy with his flagship. You know, he, he likes, he, he wants to operate. He's on this uh, converted mine uh, sweeper, the Arusto. So he, 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 he wants the Langley in a bad way, just to operate his quarters. Meanwhile, you have the XO, Kenneth Whiting, uh, the, uh, uh, the first CEO, uh, uh, Captain uh, S.H.R. Uh, Stiffy Doyle, is, is basically, he, he's a black shoe. Uh, you know, he's put, he's experienced in putting ships into commission. Whiting's the guy who's actually, uh, uh, he's an aviator uh, going back to, uh, uh, you know, he led our aviation units in France in World War One. He is the guy who, he, he wants to test flight deck procedures. He wants to get, the idea is that Langley was commissioned as an experimental carrier to operate away from the fleet so we can uh, learn how to fly and, and land and take off airplanes for the two ships that are being built or converted, the Lexington and Saratoga that we talked this morning about at the Washington Naval Arms uh, Conference, you know, there's, you know, Langley is not really envisioned to be an operational carrier in, in, in Whiting's mind. The guy who's stuck in between these two is Rear Admiral Moffat. He's the chief of aeronautics, uh, but he's got his own issue. He's dealing with this guy, uh, General Billy Mitchell, who wants to uh, you know, put aviation all in one uh, side. So kind of like what the British did doing World War I. Uh, they consolidated their naval air service and their uh, uh, army uh, service until it became the Royal Air Force. He would like to have the United States Air Force uh, come into play in the 1920s. Uh, you know, Moffat's resisting that. The other th thing that Moffat's worried about, which was brought out this, uh, uh, this morning's uh, talk at the Washington Naval Arms Conference, is not everybody on our team in the Navy is convinced that we, we need to con convert uh, Lexington and Saratoga to uh, uh, aircraft carriers. We, we, need to sp we can spend that money better elsewhere. So, uh, so the competing interest, uh, Moffat's, uh, because... You know, the golden rule, he has the gold rules, and uh, Moffat has more gold on him. He's got on his uh, uh, hat, hat bill. He, is, uh, he decides to take Langley and put it on a PR tour. In the June of 1923, Langley is pulled from Pensacola where they're doing these test operations, and it comes up to Washington, D.C. for the Shriners Convention. And why, why the Shriners Convention? Because the Shriner in chief is uh, Warren G. Harding. And Warren G. H Harding has this big party for the Shriners, you know, parades in Washington. Everybody gets to go to the White House. Uh, you know, uh, uh, John Philip Sousa, you know, leads the biggest uh, uh, chorus at, uh, you know, the baseball stadium. And it, uh, Langley actually is doing flight operation off of Haynes Point. Okay. A big impression goes very well. Wow, we got to continue doing this. Langley goes to you know on this summer tour to New York and then up to uh, New England and then uh, uh, finally comes back to Pensacola in the spring of 1924. Meanwhile, the folks in, in uh, <laughs> San Diego said, "Where's the carrier? You know, you promised us a carrier." Well, in spring of 1924, uh, they're continuing to do uh, you know uh, experiments you know, landing bigger and bigger aircraft, you know, testing the flight gear. And uh, and then, you know, uh, Langley's involved in fleet problem two, which is involving uh, the uh, Panama Canal and also supporting a uh, 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 landings at uh, Puerto Rican Island, uh, so Lebre is the, is the island. And, and Langley is, uh, you know, makes a great pressure on the fleet. Doing this uh, fleet problem, there's a big conclave with Secretary of Navy to discuss Langley's future. Langley is staying on the East Coast for now. Has to go back to the Norfolk Navy Yard because the exhaust system they initially uh, put into Langley was a fail. Uh, it's, 
you know, basically you'd have bad trash who would uh, kind of like smoke out the engineering department. So there was one stack you're going to see in, in future pictures of the Langley. There's going to be two stacks and doing flight operations. Those two stacks will, you know, will canter off the uh, uh, port side of the ship. Finally, in November of uh, 19, uh, either about 24, yeah, we make the transit through the uh, Panama Canal and he uh, arrives in. So I'm going to talk a little bit about part one, uh, settling in here to uh, San Diego. We have uh, the CEO at the time. Uh, it's, it's a new regime. Uh, Whiting and uh, uh, Doyle are gone. Captain uh, Jackson, uh, uh, Edward, it's Captain uh, Edward Sharpless Jackson. That's an interesting middle name, uh, probably a family name. But he's also known as Edward the Bald. I've yet to find a picture of him without it being uncovered. I kind of guess he's bald. And then in, in his uh, Naval Academy uh, uh, lucky bag, his nickname at the Naval Academy was Hatchet Face. So I don't know, you know what to make of that. His CEO, uh, his XO is Warren G. Child. Uh, the wonderful thing is I got his diary from the Library of Congress. This guy uh, became an avid golfer, and uh, uh, so throughout his diaries, it's uh, you know daily routine on the Langley, and then he goes out and plays out over in North Island and records his golf score. So uh, a lot, you know, it's a, a, a but a great source of information. Uh, Child, when he reports aboard, he loved the accommodations he had as an XO. One of the reasons, the pushback that Whiting was able to say that you can't come out, you can't, we're not, we're not flagship configured. You can't bring a staff on board. You know, this is just a collier with, a, you know, a flat deck on it. Uh, uh, but as soon as it pulls in, Moses and his staff comes on board. Child is kicked out of his quarters. He has, to, his new quarters is this little house here. This was the pigeon house, okay? Langley was configured to have uh, homing pigeons, you know, send reports back to the uh, carrier. If they saw, saw a battleship, you know, the uh, plane would then release a pigeon, would come back to Langley with the report, and uh, that would be transferred radio to the, to the battlefield. The problem with the pigeons was that they did all these tests. They took the pigeons out, you know, to like Richmond, uh, Anacostia. They would all fly back to the ship in Norfolk. When they went out to sea, they released the pigeons. They all went back to Norfolk. So, uh, you know, the, the pigeons couldn't really find a ship that was moving around the ocean. You know, they, they would go back to a, a spot. So the XO wound up in the uh, pigeon house. Uh, BF2 embarks. Uh, Nathan Chase is the CEO. Uh, first time, you know, the, the compliment of the uh, coming into San Diego, they had a couple of experiments, you know, uh, uh, a couple of pilots, experimental aircraft. We actually embarked a fighter squadron for the first time in history. Um, in January of 1925, you know, we had the first uh, public uh, open house come on board. They actually, if the winds are the right way, uh, Langley would be, you know, facing to the north and you have the winds coming. They, would, they did quite frequently did flight ops in port. Uh, we had fleet in February, fleet problem five. This morning I got up. Thank you, Jim, for uh, putting me up. And I looked out my window this morning, couldn't see a thing out in Port, Point, Point Loma. Apparently you get fog out here. And that's what happened when they, they departed. The uh, Robert Smith uh, hits Langley. Not too good for a little four piper here, okay? Uh, uh, has to go, uh, uh, Robert Smith has to go back into port for major repairs. Langley continues on and participates. Uh, minor role in uh, uh, Fleet Problem uh, 5, which was a defense of the Panama uh, Canal uh, issue. We have uh, uh, Grand Joint Exercise Number 3, first time uh, Langley's going to go out to Hawaii. It's an uh, operation uh, of the Blue Fleet is uh, landing and uh, driving off the Black uh, Forest, which is Japan, and uh, aircraft from uh, Langley. Uh, VF uh, uh, two are supporting lane uh, are supporting the landing operation. Unfortunately, while out in Hawaii, uh, Chase uh, is uh, it's an air collision. He bumps out. His chute fails to open. You know, so VF two is without a uh, uh, a squadron commander. Spigs Weed is uh, is the new uh, 
PF2 ordered in. The following April, Weed has a accident. It's a domestic accident. He hears something downstairs. Trips falls down the stairs and is paralyzed. Okay, he's he's trying to fight to stay in, but eventually he he's uh, meted out of the navy and he becomes a very uh, successful screenwriter. You know, lots of plays. You know, uh, screenplays about naval aviation. A lot of uh, movies are done. And eventually, his life story is portrayed in this movie, The Wings of Eagle. And he, he got John Wayne got to portray him, and Maureen O'Hara or Harry was you know, was his wife. So. You know, he, he will go down in history. You know, not too many people get John Wayne to play in, uh, you know, in the role. So that's, uh, uh, and he actually doing World War II is going to come back on active duty and, uh, and uh, support the uh, naval aviation out in the Pacific. Uh, in September, we have two uh, incidents that uh, uh, don't uh, portray the Navy's aviation in the best of life. You have the tragic loss of the airship Shenandoah. And then we have the, uh, uh, the Army had successfully, with a lot of Navy help, uh, had a uh, 40s aircraft doing this round the world trip. Uh, so the Navy decided, well, we'll want up the, the Army. And, and in doing so, we're going to send a, uh, a nonstop flight to Hawaii. Didn't quite make it. Okay. Now, the interesting st story with it is they're missing for days. They actually take uh, cloth from, from the wings and they set up a sail and they're sailing and they almost made it to Hawaii uh, this, this, the air, before a submarine uh, picked it up. Meanwhile, uh, uh, Langley takes position and, they're, uh, and it was inv very involved in the search and rescue operation. So, you know, uh, uh, Langley demonstrates uh, its utility doing this uh, uh, rescue, even though it wasn't responsible for actually uh, finding this aircraft. Uh, in October, Paul Reeves comes on the scene to relieve uh, uh, Moses as the uh, Pacific, you know, Air, Air Squadron's uh, battle fleet. Paul Reeves, uh, uh, yeah, is, uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 the uh, Mason, yeah, uh, I'm having a, a senior moment. Uh, Reeves is first name. Mason, yeah, okay, well, it, it's going to come to Joseph. Joseph Mason Reese, thank you. Oh, okay. Joseph Mason, or, you know, uh, sometimes old, old face. Or, he's familiar with Langley because he was the CEO of the Jupiter, the first CEO when uh, Jupiter was built at Bear Island back in uh, 1913. So he has some familiarity. Uh, he's, he goes on board uh, Langley up at Bear Island because uh, Langley is, 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 you know, goes periodic uh, uh, you know, maintenance up there. And then he comes back down to San Diego to meet with the pilots at uh, North Island. And he, he gives his famous 1001 uh, question speech. I do not know the answer to these questions, like dozens of them, more than you do. But we can answer them. Until we can answer them, we will be little in use to the fleet. That means we must become a school before we become an Air Force. And that school is going to be the line. Uh, uh, Reeves and uh, Charles uh, Hughes, the commander of the battle fleet, they don't see eye to eye. You know, Reeves is a traditional black shoe. He just sees the purpose of aircraft as being scouts for the battle fleet. Go find the enemy, locate them, and, you know, tell us if our, our bullets hit. Uh, you know, Reeves is really pushing the idea that aircraft, and, and this is where we're talking about the Washington Naval uh, Conference. This is where the innovation comes in. Reeves is a big driver behind that, but uh, he is, uh, yeah, he's, he's pushing the envelope. Now, you got this guy, uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, Patrick N. Bellinger, who is his staff guy. And every time uh, uh, the walrus, as he was called, kicks uh, uh, Reeves out, it's Bellinger says, you know, a boss, he he's not really, th these are good ideas. You ought to kind of like listen to him. So Bellinger kind of, uh, uh, you know, is, is talking to, uh, you know, uh, he's allowing Reeves to do more and more stuff. Uh, yeah, fleet problem five, uh, simulates uh, rescue in the uh, Philippines. Again, uh, Langley's uh, is, is played a big moral role. 
Uh, John Towers is coming on board as the XO. Eventually, uh, he's going to be fleeted up to the uh, CO spot. John Towers is the first guy. He's, he's uh, Naval Aviator number three. Uh, he's actually going to get commander of uh, Langley as a commander uh, and uh, the first CO of the uh, Langley with actual you know, your wings. Uh, the uh, Langley's getting more capable aircraft, uh, you know, and uh, there's a need for the, uh, uh, they, they realize that there's going to be a need to strengthen the flight deck, extend the, the flight deck during uh, uh, 1926. February, they head to the Caribbean for Fleet Problem 7. Then they got to do East Coast port visits, a, a presidential review. There's going to be a major exercise off of uh, Rhode Island, and then you're going to return in June. Doing this trip, you know, the, the folks at the Brooklyn Navy Yard are taking measurements. You know, how are we going to extend the flight deck? They had this idea to extend the flight deck forward, didn't it? But they realized that it's hard enough to see forward from the uh, bridge of the ship, which is underneath the flight deck. They don't do that, but they will extend the, uh, the, the stern for course. Uh, Reeves is actually promoted to rear admiral in late 1927. Uh, the Langley is reclassified as an operational versus experimental carrier. Tensions with Commander Towers. There's a, uh, and it's kind of interesting. There's a uh, oral history that's published in this edition of, uh, and I and I could read the whole thing, but I, the point of it is, is that uh, Reeves wanted to set the record for takeoff and landing in one day. And Bogan is uh, at this time, Gerald Bogan is the squadron commander. And he, uh, uh, he says, I, you know, where I travel up to Seattle, it's heavy seas, 50 knot winds over deck. Uh, and, uh, you know, Bogan said, you can't do that. You need certain headwinds. And Reeves said, well, we'll just go backwards then just to, you know, get, and, and uh, they went ahead and did it. And, you know, a lot of the pilots refused to, to fly. So, Bogan and Pete Michener are taking different airplanes and taking off and landing. Bogan, uh, late in the day, actually crashes. His aircraft goes over the side of the ship. He's picked up by the Arista, but they made 129 takeoffs and landings that day, okay? Just, you know, to satisfy Reeves' urge to... Uh, so this is why there is tension between Reeves and Towers, who kind of has an interest in the uh, life expectancy of his pilots. Uh, yeah, it's tension. There is a near fatal aviation gas fire, December 20th uh, of that year. Uh, there is one fatality. There's a, a, a couple of burns. Uh, you had a couple of the uh, uh, aircraft tenders came in, fire support, uh, San Diego uh, uh, fire department comes in. You know, if the fire had reached the main ta uh, storage tank, uh, you know, we, this our my talk would be ending right here. It didn't, but they realized that there were some vulnerabilities they had to address. Uh, it was kind of interesting. I was reading the uh, uh, the San Diego Union the next day. You know, they announced who was killed. They announced the widow, and they gave her a dress so you can write condolence letters to the widow. You know, I, I just couldn't, couldn't picture you. You wouldn't do that today. Uh, um, so. Uh, so Langley goes up to Mare Island for a, uh, uh, you know, to, to get repaired from this fire. Also, the, uh, to get the deck extended, as we talked about. And the idea is that they're going to build additional quarters to take on additional staff and a second air squadron. For some reason, uh, Captain uh, uh, Commander Towers tells the Navy, don't bother to do that. All right. So, you know, the ship comes back to San Diego without the additional quarters and he's at, and, and Reeves is pissed. OK, so Reeves uh, basically shows up with uh, with trucks and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, lumber and they build the additional quarters while it's in port. And then Reeves is there like and now we're going to uh, uh, load 42 aircraft on this ship and towers is. You know, they, they spot the aircraft and this is, we can't get that many. Reeves literally goes on the flight deck and is moving aircraft around and he's able to get 42, you know, 36 up on the deck and then uh, six below for the upcoming uh, uh, fleet problem. 
you know, so, you know, you know, here you have this, this big load of aircraft. Of course, Towers, uh, you know, he's really concerned about, you know, this, the safety factor. Fleet uh, problem eight is the battle problem that never was. You have this, uh, uh, the Blue Fleet uh, commander, uh, this dire has taken his fleet from San Francisco and it's going to be a rescue again. The evil black forces have taken over Hawaii. Uh, the blue fleet is going to, uh, you know, rescue the day. The black fleet is going to Hawaii. Uh, they're departing from uh, San Diego, and the uh, uh, the CEO of the uh, the commander of the of the, the black fleet, uh, this Admiral Day, he had his navigator said, "Well, the uh, first of all, you know." Uh, the, they're going to be leaving San Francisco on the outward tide, so that's going to be midday. Oh, by the way, their slowest ship in their, their squadron is uh, this auxiliary can only go nine knots. So based on uh, those assumptions, they're going to arrive to Hawaii at this time. So, you know, they uh, make their way to Hawaii. Well, what the Steiger does is, first of all, he sends his auxiliaries against the tide uh, out first to get a head start. And then once they get out there, he takes the slow ships under tow to get them up to 12 knots. So the blue fleet arrives in Hawaii before the black fleet can arrive. There's no, there is no battle problem. So Langley is going to stay stick around. And uh, on um, in, in mid-May, uh, they're going to conduct a, a surprise attack on uh, the uh, defenses at uh, uh, you know, Wheeler uh, and other fields of Hawaii. Basically, 35 uh, aircraft, uh, 4, uh, 37 a.m., every 12 seconds, uh, the flight deck is gone, seven minutes. Total surprise. And, uh, you know, then the Langley's Airmen provide air cover to defend the battleships as they approach the coast to simulate firing on coastal uh, fortifications. Norman Freeman, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, uh, corresponded back and forth. And I, I mentioned this, you know, Reeves realized that the capacity was tied to the way the flight deck operated. He challenged his flyers to do a lot better. Out of this came the combination of deck parking and tightly controlled landing, which the U.S. Navy, but not other uh, carrier navies, developed. You can see the results of this rapidly growing aircraft capacity of the ship. That is why at Midway, three U.S. carriers had nearly the same capacity as four Japanese. War gaming experience shaped Yorktown class, and that turned and shaped the Essexes. This is, you know, follows on nicely what we heard what uh, Jonathan Parcell talked about yesterday with his, uh, you know, simulations uh, uh, with, with this incredible victory, not so incredible. And it, it talks, uh, this, you know, is a nice follow on to our little uh, discussion this morning on the uh, Washington Naval Office about the innovations at this uh, that, uh, treaty. Which is kind of interesting. Last uh, week, at uh, last uh, week ago Friday, I gave a speech to the Daughters of the American Revolution at DAR headquarters. I'm looking around, and they're like, "This is the room where it happened." So it, it was uh, it, it was kind of neat to, to actually be in the room where they uh, they signed that uh, treaty. So anyway, uh, I end the story here because Lexington uh, arrives on the scene after a record-breaking sprint from, uh, uh, I believe it was San Francisco, out to uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. And it's, it takes off one of the squadrons. And now Langley is no longer the sole carrier, but it's going to be uh, Lexington and Saratoga are going to be the Navy's three carriers. Ranger's going to be coming in on 1934. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that next year, uh, if I have a chance. And uh, uh, we'll... Uh, uh, I know open it up for questions. Uh, that is me, Dave Winkler, NavyHistory.org at the Naval Historical Foundation. If you have any questions about, uh, you know, the Naval Historical Foundation, uh, 